Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference channel. My name is Jesse Day. We are bringing the VRIC to you with our series of expert online panels. We have another great one lined up for you today. We've got Gary Wagner, producer of The Gold Forecast, and Tavi Costa of Crestcat Capital. We're going to be discussing gold and silver, very exciting times for the precious metals, as well as touching on the broad market as well. Gentlemen, it's an honor to have you on the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Great to have you both here. And let's start with your current views on the broad market and economy. Feel free to take this wherever you'd like. I'm wondering what are the main threads you're both watching right now that you think investors should be paying attention to? Maybe some things that could be flying under the radar that, that people aren't paying as much attention to as they should be. And Gary, I'll start with you. Well, obviously, what we are following closer than ever is the Federal Reserve and their timing of rate cuts. Now, for the second time in a row, meaning the last two dot plots, they've come out and they've said they're still looking at three quarter percent rate cuts this year. Most analysts, including myself, are anticipating that June will be what I'm calling liftoff date or the point in time in which they implement the first quarter percent cut. Of course, they say that they're data dependent. They are. Um, but then when we got a hot inflationary report a couple of weeks back, it didn't seem to change the outlook of the Fed. So it seems as though they're pretty much on target. And the last point that I'll make is that uh, Chairman Powell has come out emphatically saying we don't need to get to 2%. We need to know that the trajectory is headed to 2%. Yes, Fed speak. You've got to love it. Tavi, what, what are you watching right now when it comes to the markets and the economy? Well, I think there's some very important developments happening uh, in the treasury market right now. Uh, this move in yields that we're seeing in the 10 year is going to have some major implications in other things. It's, it's fascinating me, the fact that we're seeing you know, this flood of issuances, but really the problem is uh, the downward pressure on the price of treasuries is not yet being caused by selling of foreign central banks, which is you know, yet to come, in my opinion. So uh, we're seeing this transition towards gold. And when I say transition, may might not be the right word because we're just seeing them actually buying gold, not really selling overall treasuries. This is in the data. It's not my opinion. Um and there is certainly the case for a reacceleration of inflation that I think it's happening, it used to be more under the surface, but it's it's now becoming more materialized from many fronts. I mean, we're seeing oil uh, starting to break out recently, going above $85 a barrel. Uh, that's an interesting development. Uh, we're seeing things like agricultural commodities surging in prices um, and now, we've had the, the container and the freight costs globally starting to rise as well. Um, all that is 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 likely to have an impact on uh, inflation numbers here soon. And what is interesting is um, this political fad that we're seeing in terms of choosing not to look at uh, uh, inflation, instead look at uh, labor markets and other issues that we're seeing because uh, inflation is reaccelerating very uh, and it's very clear on the data. If you look at the commodities equal weighted index, it's already up almost uh, twelve percent from its lows here recently. So uh, that is, you know, yet to uh, to uh, to cause more impact on prices of consumers uh, consumer goods overall. And I, I think that that's uh, that's going to be an important development for the near future. Um, I used to say that I liked the 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 call options in in oil. I think that that's that's starting to really play out that there are other things that need to happen here as we see these things unfolding you know emerging markets resilience is something i pay very close attention to the importance of hard assets in this environment is also uh you know critical the fact that we're seeing uh one of the most restrictive monetary policies in history as they say but when you look at monetary bays in the us and even japan and other places is actually rising and so that's all Part of this this big story that I think is is still very positive for hard assets and commodities. A lot to unpack there, but I want to hone into what you were saying. Um, and you posted a chart 
about this on Twitter, which I'm going to edit on screen. Um, and I want to quote you here. You wrote, central banks are starting to show their cards, and this surge in gold has been relentless. It is remarkable to see this price behavior on days when treasuries fall and inflation expectations rise. The race to improve the quality of their international reserves is just getting started. Expand on that for us. And then afterwards, Gary, I'll turn to you and get your thoughts as well. Well, first of all, the, what's happening is, you know, I believe we're entering an inflationary era. Uh, and that just means a, a decade where inflation rates are likely to be higher than historical standards. Um, and if that's the case, it, it has a lot of implications in the global economy. Number one, it's it creates a, a higher cost of capital environment. And if that's also the case, then uh, interest rates are pressure higher. Cost of equity is also pressure higher, but let's just focus on cost of debt for now. If that is actually rising, uh, what you tend to see is who are the biggest holders of those instruments? Well, central banks, they're the ones that really hold a significant portion of sovereign debt. And so the deterioration of the price uh, movement of those, of those instruments uh, directly impact those institutions. And when you think about a monetary system, it is really anchored uh, on the base of, of what they hold in their international reserves. And so I believe we're in the process of seeing this, this you know, situation of an inflationary era being reflected in the markets, causing central banks to actually have to improve the quality of their international reserves. And what I mean by central banks showing their cards is that those numbers that we're all watching, seeing central banks accumulating gold at record pace, just, again, is a validation of that thesis. And so for many reasons, they want to own a neutral asset. Um, you know, there's deglobalization trends happening that are highly inflationary. Um, and there are other ways you can think about this too. You know, most macro investors would look at gold and think that gold usually or tends to trade with uh, real rates. And those are usually times when you have a disinflationary setting that really creates that correlation uh, situation. But in the 70s, that wasn't the case at all. In the 70s, uh, we did see rates increasing and gold increasing. And so it makes sense that we're actually seeing a, a fall in treasury prices and gold actually rallying. It's just, again, it's central banks moving towards the metal in a large way. And it's probably one of the most relevant things unfolding because if we are indeed in the beginning of a secular movement for gold, which it is my kind of, uh, no, the central uh, piece of my thesis, if that's the case, then a lot of things are going to be unleashed. I've never seen a gold bull market that doesn't unleash a commodities market. It doesn't unleash a silver market, a copper market, a emerging market market. <laughs> so there's a lot of things uh, dominoes to fall and fall is not the right word because they're likely to rise. Um, and, you know, as we see this rotation into uh, a portion of the market that has been neglected for so long. And Gary, your thoughts on Tavi's thesis, central bank gold buying, do you also see inflation accelerating up ahead as well? Well, I, I think um, Tavi brought up some excellent points. The one thing that I always think about with inflation is once, let's say the Federal Reserve, and that's only one of the central banks that we're dealing with, gets inflation to a 2% target, prices aren't going to then begin to decline. In other words, the new structure, the elevated level of prices are going to be maintained. You don't see a disinflationary period coming after what we're witnessing now. The central banks, the fact that they have been um, really buying a lot of gold is very interesting. It tells me that they're looking at that asset class as having the greatest weight in terms of stability. And then one thing that we haven't really discussed is we've got uh, geopolitical concerns all over the world, what's going on in the Middle East, what's going on in Russia, and those will weigh heavily, especially on agricultural prices when you think of Ukraine and Russia, because Ukraine is such a large producer of corn and wheat. Well, I'd like to pull on that thread a little bit and get your thoughts on the current geopolitical landscape. How much of an effect do you see it having? Let's follow a scenario where global conflict continues to expand. 
um, from here. Do you see that having a lasting impact potentially on the gold, maybe silver prices, other commodities, as you mentioned? How do you see that playing out, Gary? I'll, I'll go to you first. Well, one thing that we have to realize is that uh, the shipping lane in the Red Sea is responsible for a large percentage of European goods, not so much in the US or North America. But for Europe, that is a primary a lane in which they get their oil and other commodities. If that continues to be troublesome, of course, the cost of shipping, the cost of insurance, all of that is going to ratchet up. We talked about oil prices breaking above $85 per barrel, and that, of course, adds to the cost of transports of goods, as well as all services are going to be utilizing energy in some way or another. Whether or not they're directly involved in energy, they're still moving fleets of their products from one place to the other, and that takes energy. So all of that I see spiraling and continuing uh, to become elevated. I think that the the days of $2,000 or $2,200 gold are over. We just broke above $2,300. We'll probably see it dip back down. But as a whole, we're seeing prices of gold that we have never seen. These are you know new historical highs. And I think that these highs are really here to stay and not transitory, so to speak. And Tavi, continued expansion of global conflict, obviously bad for humanity, but is it good for commodities prices? Um, yeah, I think there's two types of deglobalization trends unfolding currently. One is the the general one, which is the uh, this this need for countries to really make sure that they their uh, reliance on operations of other economies uh, is is not necessarily a risk, a national risk. Uh, uh, for their own nations. And so um, I think that that's, that's one part of it. And it's been causing one of the most, uh, uh, one of the largest reshoring trends that we've seen probably in history. When I say reshoring, really is manufacturing construction uh, and construction overall. Uh, this infrastructure bill that has been passed, uh, which is close to $1.7 trillion, it's $1.2 trillion plus $500 billion from the Inflation Act. Uh, Reduction Act, it's, um, you know, it, it dwarfs what we've seen in history. If you adjust for inflation and using U.S. dollars from today, and you looked at how much globally, not just the U.S., countries spend uh, on to rebuild the global economy after the World War II, you know, it was close to $500 billion. Now, we're talking three times that amount. So I don't think we've ever seen in, at least in the last few centuries, at least the, as much data I, I can gather historically, uh, this type of, of infrastructure development in, in many centuries. And so maybe Industrial Revolution might have been a comparable, but it is certainly of a degree and magnitude that is likely to become one of the main reasons for the demand side of commodities. Um, you know, what's happening with artificial intelligence, as, as another example, is is likely to be also very deflationary but first we need to build things and you know this risk of electricity shortages and other things is creating also the need for electrical grids to be revamped and other things and so all that is going to generate the large demand coming from uh from commodities and the other thing to point out is the second form of deglobalization which is more on the financial side for many decades, what we've seen is countries have been helping or supporting each other's uh, government's needs, meaning when a country wanted to do fiscal stimulus on the back of actually not receiving the same level of tax revenues, in other words, running a deficit for a long time, which has been the case with most uh, developed economies, um, they have been basically buying each other's sovereign debt, particularly countries outside of the U.S., and so they've been buying the U.S. Uh, uh, treasuries uh, for a long time. And I think that's at, at its end. Now, when you looked at, they're not selling it yet, but when you looked at the amount of issuances that we're seeing relative to how much those uh, institutions have been buying, that is definitely very concerning. So those are big changes in, in the macro landscape in which gold is, pl gold is playing a big role as, as, a, as a neutral asset one more time. And so, uh, you know, those are important, long-lasting 
uh, shifts in the global economy and deglobalization is likely here to stay. And when people talk about interest rates is staying you know, higher for longer, I really think it's really inflation staying higher for longer. That is not to say we're going to see ups and downs, but that really boils down to higher prices for consumers uh, over time. And, and again, that's going to have major implications in, in markets. And Gary, I want to touch on something you noted in your gold forecast, where you said, interestingly, the gains in gold occurred despite moderate strength in the U.S. dollar, typically a headwind for the precious metal. This resilience underscores the intense demand for gold as a hedge against economic uncertainty. Now, obviously, the move of central banks to accumulate is potentially because of economic uncertainty in the environment we're in in that respect. I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more about the role you see gold playing in that sense. And from the people I've talked to, they're saying that retail buying, particularly in the West, is not that high. Do you think that trend could also shift and we could start to see individual retail investors in the West start to embrace gold as a hedge against uncertainty up ahead? Well, I, I certainly believe that um, using gold as a hedge and part of a major component of a portfolio rather than a minor allocation in one's portfolio is going to be something that grows. The one thing that we really need to touch on because we've hit pretty much all of the corners of what we think the macro scenario is going to be revolving around, it's national debt because all of these infrastructure builds, all of these projects, what we're doing in the United States is simply raising our level of debt and the just the interest payments, for example, in the United States um, to service the debt that we've got. I think we're at a little in excess, a little north of uh, $34 trillion. Janet Yellen, Chairman Powell, many of uh, government officials that work with budgets and work with interest rates have said that it is absolutely not sustainable. And at some point, at some point, I would think the piper needs to get paid and what repercussions will occur at the point when some of the other countries that have been buying, for example, U.S. debt, start to cash those in. And that could be further on down the road, but I think that that's a tremendous issue that has to be dealt with sooner than later. And Tavi, your thoughts on the debt issues that is, are being faced by both the US and many governments around the world, Japan obviously in a lot of trouble with the yen hitting the lowest levels versus the USD in since the 1990s, since the year 1990 actually, I believe. Um, how does this all get resolved? What role will gold play? Well, I think it's monetary dilution becomes, I mean, countries and the global economy is basically addicted to always resorting back to uh, monetary dilution or liquidity, per se, in order to fix issues that we have in either regional problems or more uh, systemic issues that we've seen in the past. Um, and I don't think that's likely to change. Uh, the fiscal dominance that a lot of people talk about is is also a big a big problem. I mean, the reckless amount of fiscal spending we're seeing in line with the monetary stimulus is still is 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 in my view one of the most important things happening right now. And so we got to think about this from a purchasing power uh, perspective because as investors, uh, there is, there is a lot of opportunities still to be uh, investing in. And it's not, you know, it's it's interesting because I call this a trifecta of macro imbalances, especially in the US. It's the first time we're seeing the debt problem of the 1940s, the inflation of the 1970s, uh, and the valuation problem of the late uh, 20s and late 90s. Uh, and so we've never seen those three things at once. We've seen them independently. But, uh, you know, I've never seen an inflation period where valuations of financial assets are ex as extreme as they are cur currently. So how does it all resolve, especially when cost of capital has been rising as well? Um, you know, I can come up with a lot of potential scenarios, but the one that comes to mind that is the most important one is this study that you go back to periods like the 1940s, the 1910s, and 1970s, and clearly 
uh, hard assets or or commodities tend to do very well. So that's why I like to focus on those things. And to me, ultimately, this this environment and this need for creating growth with you know more units of debt to create less units of actually economic uh, units in 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 terms of GDP. Um, it's it's very troubling, you know. It's gonna, this the situation of of construction spending really uh, propelled by the governments that we're seeing in the U.S. and we're yet to see in other economies um, is is also uh, something that I would pay very close attention to because it is ultimately what drives um, the the demand for commodities overall. So um, those are all very important things. And you know, to one last point about what's happening with gold. Uh, from an allocation uh, standpoint, uh, there's two big poles of capital we need to pay attention to. Yes, central banks are accumulating the metal, and you pointed out that Western societies haven't really been buying gold, and hence why we're seeing this also the, the divergence between gold prices rising and miners not doing very well is because who's been buying gold has been really central banks, and they don't buy miners, and that's why <laughs> there's a divergence between the two. Now, if you ask my opinion, I think that's a matter of time for those to follow suit because ultimately the value of a project that is now in you know improving economically speaking uh, is likely to be also attracting capital from investors over time as they start to see the asymmetry. So those two poles of capital institutions and the second one is traditional investment portfolios, a 60-40 portfolios. Those guys are yet to change their allocation uh, and start putting capital into gold. And one of the most important data points that it relates to the debt question you asked is that this is the first time in 45 years that gold has a better volatility profile than treasuries. What does that mean? If you just calculate downside volatility, so if you own an asset, the volatility that it, when it goes down, and you just look at those numbers, which is the most important thing for any person running a traditional portfolio. Why do they own treasuries? It's not because of the yield necessarily. Well, it didn't used to be. Now with 5%, maybe it's a little more, but it's because it, it, it tends to rise uh, during turmoil. Uh, now, if you see the downside volatility of those instruments is starting to increase to a degree that is substantially higher than gold, then it starts to create a very... Um, you know, I would say intelligent argument uh, to potentially start allocating capital towards gold. And so I think that we're yet to see that. We haven't seen that movement of Western societies and not just them, but really traditional portfolios is starting to look at gold as a defensive asset for their own uh, for their own allocation. So that's that's going to be a big change in prices, in my opinion, when that happens. What's up, guys? Quick break. My name is Jay Martin. I'm the CEO of Cambridge House and the host of the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. I wanted to quickly point your attention to a link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to our new weekly newsletter. If you want to better understand the minds of the best investors in the resource space, subscribe to this newsletter. I author it personally every Sunday and I love writing it. Hit that link below to subscribe. All right, back to the interview. So how do you both see the setup for silver currently? What are the main drivers and catalysts that you see potentially propelling that price higher? We're hovering around the $27 an ounce level. This has excited a lot of silver bugs. Um, you know, a lot of the, the prominent experts in the silver space continue to emphasize that patience is important and silver is a trade where you need to have a lot of patience. Uh, but there's been all sorts of hyperbolic language in the silver sector as well for years, talking about silver is going to $50 this year again and again and again. So people are getting kind of tired of it. So I, a lot of people are hopeful right now, but I'm wondering what you see as the main catalyst and drivers for silver as we sit here today. And Gary, I'll start with you. Well, obviously with silver, you have some differences when compared to gold. Primary is industrial demand and the high utilization of silver in green components, whether it be solar panels and other electronics. The interesting thing about silver and gold is we used to see a much more tandem move between gold and silver. Silver would tend to outperform gold if they were both moving up in terms of percentage gain. That still occurs when they move in tandem. On the way down, you have a larger drawdown. In other words, an increased volatility with silver over gold. 
But we had a major decoupling occur uh, over a decade ago because after hitting $50 when we hit the all-time record high back in the middle of uh, 2011, we never really saw when gold began to rise again, it, it went down to about 1,000, 1,020 per ounce at the end of 2015 beginning of 2016 and started to climb, silver never caught up with that. And that's when we really saw a decoupling of that relationship. And really that plagued the gold-silver ratio. My sense is that for silver to return to its glory days, so to speak, it's going to be about industrial utilization because it is used much less in terms of an inflationary hedge. The go-to metal has, and I believe will continue to be gold over silver. So it's all about industrial usage. And that goes back to the point that both of us just made. And that is the tremendous amount of debt that governments are incurring is not sustainable. And at some point it will bottleneck and it will affect the government programs, the infrastructure programs, the high technology programs that are going on that are subsidized by various countries that, <clears throat> excuse me, will change the dynamics. So in terms of silver moving back to its glory days of $50, so let me see it go over 30 first. I, until then, I can't be in that camp. And Tavi, unpack your current thoughts on the silver market for us. I wouldn't say we have a different view, but I think we have a different approach. Um, I think there's different types of investors and, you know, there's many ways to skin the cat here. <laughs> but um, um, the, my my or my approach, I should say, or our approach in terms of the fund is is to buy things when they're really undervalued. So, you know, we've been able to buy the seventh largest silver mine in the world. We did a leverage buyout of a private company recently. And that didn't happen because we saw... The, the confirmation of a technical movement to the upside on silver. That happened because nobody wanted to touch the metal. So those, those types of distress opportunities only appear when nobody wants to be invested in the space. Now, we're starting to see some confirmation of the thesis. I was part of one of the guys that thought silver would have moved three years ago. And to be fair, nobody knows when it's gonna start move. We all can do lines and technical charting analysis but nobody really knows when things really break out. Now, in my opinion, it is basically a, a roadmap for, for us just to look at silver prices in the end terms, which is already retested the 2011 highs. And in my opinion, the same was happening with gold in the end terms, was leading the way to the upside before actually gold in, in US dollar terms. And now, if I think of that as a roadmap, I'm always considering investments uh, with the idea of thinking, how would the project look like if we have silver prices at fifty, a hundred dollars? Because that's my belief. I think ultimately we're going to go there. And so, being able to purchase assets that have leverage to the silver price uh, in a big way at these at these levels, to me, it's it's a great opportunity. So uh, things are starting to move, and it's it, to me, it's it's a great uh, setting when you have the gold to silver ratio still at eighty plus. Um, and it's a historical high. It's as high as it was during the death of the global financial crisis back in 08, when silver went on to have an incredible period of appreciation all the way to 2011, those highs that we're all chasing at the $50 level. Um, another thing to point out that is, is very important for silver is a constrained situation regarding the supply side. Supply is something I pay very close attention to because the demand side, I think it's going to take care of itself. And the supply side to me is very concerning is the fact that production for silver has been declining. And if you look at Mexico and Peru, I have a chart on this where you look at the combined production of that. It's down close to 25%. It's at the same price or same level as it was 14 years ago. So, you know, if I know that potentially, I, I don't know it, but I think that demand is going to be on the upside. And I know that supply is likely to be constrained for a very long time, given the fact that we haven't seen many discoveries of silver, then that makes to me a, a very compelling thesis to own the metal and to kind of establish a strategy 
to accumulate assets to have leverage to the metal over time. So that's really my strategy. But I respect people that want to just wait for the confirmation. That's their, um, you know, that's the way to invest. Everybody has their own way. And and uh, I just I just think that to me, I like to take advantage of those very distressed opportunities, which they can get more distress. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. But um, to me, when the when the the value proposition along with the macro proposition kind of come together, uh, uh, it's a matter of time until the technical side actually plays out. And I'm wondering how you both see the gold and silver mining sector set up, um, because you brought it up there, Tavi. Uh, obviously, people are pointing out that very undervalued compared to the metal itself in both cases, but particularly when it comes to the gold space, we are starting to see a move in some of the miners now. I'm wondering what your thoughts are there. Um, is now a good entry point in your view? Do you think there's value to be had all throughout the various development phases from exploration up to the majors, to the royalties and streamers? What are your overall thoughts on the gold and silver mining space right now? And Gary, I'll start with you. Well, in terms of the mining space, I don't follow it that closely because like equities, when I look at various mines and operations, it's not a, a stock market, but a market of stock. So it's not a mining scenario. It's individual mines, their cost to produce, uh, what they're paying out to what they're taking in and what the storage is or what the potential is for that particular mine. And because that is so individual in terms of mine to mine, it's something that I've stayed away from only because the complexity, I, you can't make a generalization like you can about where we think gold is going, about what a mine is going to do in terms of profitability. So that's something that I've always shied away from because I think that we can get very nice returns without you taking into account those individual parameters that need to be addressed when we look at individual mines, their output, and what the cost is to do that. Yeah, I think that's a fantastic perspective. Um, and that's why it's great to have both of you on here with your own views and approaches to the market. Uh, Tavi, how do you see the, the gold and silver mining space set up at present? Where Where is Cre Crestcat looking for, for opportunity and value? Um, fundamentally, they have been improving. So if you look at the top 10 companies, and we often talk about the second wave of inflation, but there's a second wave of free cash flow unfolding across most of the major companies, and they're starting to make more money, recently generate more cash flow. And at the same time, what we're seeing is that the prices have collapsed and Newmont is down 60, 70% from its peak levels. And there's some other examples, not to pick on Newmont specifically, uh, but there's some other examples. So the, the valuation of some of those companies have uh, drastically improved. And so that is one thing to point out. The second thing has been the fact that we're starting to see the M&A cycle uh, being triggered. And there has been many, uh, or I should say, shouldn't say many, but there has been some cases of, 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 of takeouts from the smaller businesses as well, and even mergers between uh, the big, the bigger companies too. Uh, and, and those are important signs for the bullish uh, environment that we may see in the mining space. Um, it's for me, you know, the, the, the fundamental reason why I like metals and mining as an industry is because I find it hard to believe we're going to see all this construction and this global deglobalization trends continue to escalate in an inflationary era and seeing all these companies reshoring green revolution without making the metals and mining industry significantly higher portion of the economy. And today it's basically a margin error. And so, you know, we've seen all these years of very difficult industry to invest, but I think we're at the kind of the tail end of that. And it's, I, it, to me, it presents a great opportunity. One way you can think about this as well, it's been a divergence between gold miners relative to gold, uh, which have been declining, and you can see copper mines relative to copper, which has been increasing. A lot of people think that the gold miners decline has been really caused because of the cost structure. But if, if it was a cost structure, both of those copper mines and gold mines would have been, uh, you know, both of them would have been uh, impacted by that issue. And I think the main reason for that is because gold companies, when you look at their underlying asset, the deterioration of their reserves has been much more significant than the copper mines. 
Uh, and so if you look at the average grade of, of the existing uh, reserves of most of the gold mines, uh, they've been deteriorating much faster than the copper. And so that's one important aspect. Now, I've been always of the view that we've had a secular decline of interest in geology uh, from undergrads and graduate students. Uh, when you look at those, uh, those applications for those programs across the globe, uh, we've seen a big decline of interest. And when I think about this industry, um, the more you go to the early stages side of a company, uh, the more you need to, uh, it requires that you know about geology because exploration is basically almost entirely a geology uh, game. And understanding those drill results and those intercepts and, and, the, and, and how much every situation that they progress in their project, how much does that change the probability of finding a new discovery is sort of a very inefficient uh, situation. You can even call it like Einhorn likes to call it a fundamentally broken public market. And the main reason for that is because of a lack of people watching that market and being able to interpret the data uh, correctly. Now, it creates, I think in the money management industry, an efficiency is also a word for opportunity. And so if you're able to accumulate those assets in which have been intrinsically improving, putting out great results and improving the, 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 the probability of finding major discoveries, well, that gets really interesting because now you can take an activist approach to improve the quality of those companies uh, and improve your odds of, of, of actually making money. Not to mention the tailwind that could come from a macro environment in which favors miners, in which gold is breaking out and silk, well, gold's already breaking out and silver is doing very well in other metals that actually improves the economics of those, those projects as well. And so when people ask me, you know, why invest in gold? What is the catalyst? I mean, look at the gold price. The gold price is mainly the, the, the main catalyst. If, if that's declining, it changes the whole economics of all this. And the other important thing is these, this is a very difficult industry to invest. I mean, every decade, those things basically lose money. However, there are times in history you want to own them. And they're usually inflationary times. And I think really strongly we are in another inflationary era that will favor those companies in a big way. And my last point is the sentiment of this industry is in the toilet. Um, if you just look at, you know, and ask people, uh, I think gold miners, not silver, not uranium, gold miners specifically are probably the most hated industry in the whole market. And I think usually, um, you know, skepticism morphs uh, into opportunity at some point. And I think we're in the process of seeing that. Great breakdown. Gary, could you give us some insights into your own investment strategy when it comes to the precious metals? I know you're an expert on technical analysis. Talk to us about your time frame. Do you do more short-term trading in the metals themselves? And what, what are the other assets besides the precious metals that you also um, trade or invest in? Okay, well, uh, I, I focus on not only just the precious metals, but futures trading in the precious metals, which of course ratchets up the risk reward ratio um, because of the leverage that's obtained when you're trading futures contracts. And so what I focus on in terms of my timeline is always be to be an interim or position trader. I have tended to look at people that I highly respected as I was young getting into the industry, uh, such as George Soros or there were quite a few that would really want to work with the trend and stay with the trend as long as they could see the market moving in their anticipated direction. I think that overall, the most profitable traders are trend traders, and that's what I've stuck with. Very interesting. What, what is your time horizon, generally speaking? Are you day trading? Do you sometimes extend the time you spend in positions to longer time durations? No, it's it's typically anywhere between uh, six weeks to three months. The trade that we just got involved in, um, we bought gold about $100 below current pricing. And we, as a futures trader, continue to raise our stops up. So we've locked in a about $100 per contract profit now. And the question is whether or not 
once we've reached that 2300, if we'll see a round of profit taking come into the market, of course, that occurs part and parcel differently than a lot of the environmental things that we watch, like uh, geopolitical upticks in terms of conflicts. And that I would be surprised if it runs from 23 straight to 25. But if it does, we will continue to maintain our long position and continue to raise our stops. Great insights there. Let's end on the Fed. Gary, you spoke about this at the top of the interview and what their next move will be. You're, we were talking about three rate cuts <clears throat> this year, potentially, um, and Powell saying that we don't have to actually be at 2%. We just have to see it going towards 2%. Um, I think eventually that will morph into, guys, 4% is probably okay moving forward, but we'll have to see. Um, are they backed into a corner here? What what do you think their next move is? Because I feel like they're partially politically motivated here. Um, and Tavi, I'll start with you on this one. Um, I would agree. I think it just certainly seems like, well, look, the Fed actually has an option to look at two things, inflation and labor markets. Um, there's maybe a case to be made that labor markets have been deteriorating enough that uh, could be um, could justify a move of interest rates but i would i would say that that's not a strong case yet i do think labor markets could deteriorate much further and we're seeing signs of that in many ways um but more importantly we're in an uh, elections year so it is highly likely the fed is being political because if you look at monetary conditions falling apart or i should say loosening at the same time as we're seeing a surge of of uh, of inflation expectation I shouldn't call a surge, that's too big of a word, but certainly in a, a reacceleration of inflation uh, in the data. And the data that I'm referring to outside of what I said already would be the break evens, you know, something the Fed should often pay very close attention to, which is the, 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 the market's expectation of where CPI is likely to be. And so if the Fed is paying attention to that, inflation expectation by the markets is actually increasing on the five year, 10 year, 30 year, two year. You name it, all durations, and so um, I think that that's that's an environment where if the Fed is likely to be, and I'll, I'll propose here another idea that I really like, because if the Fed is likely to be dovish uh, with inflation reaccelerating, that to me is a perfect setup for uh, a steepening of the yield curve, because you know the the short end is not going to move much, but the long end is likely to move because of a likely reacceleration of inflation, and so. I really like that trade as a, as a way of playing this this Fed conundrum that we're seeing. And Gary, your thoughts on the Fed's next move? Well, I, I do agree with with both of your your statements and points. And the one thing that we need to bring back into the discussion is that the level of current interest rates is set by the Fed funds rate is making debt payments, the interest on debt substantially higher. And when you're talking about the kind of debt, for example, the United States is dealing with $34 trillion, every percentage point makes a tremendous difference in terms of the monthly obligations and paying on that debt. So in that way, I think that the Federal Reserve is also being pressured because they realize that having Fed funds rates at five, five and a half percent, and then paying interest on national debt at this level is an untenable um, scenario with no real solution except to either a reduce the debt or and reduce the cost of borrowing money which right now is elevated and i think that that's the primary point in terms of the fed being backed in against a wall is they realize that keeping interest rates as elevated as they are makes it very difficult for the government to just service the interest on current debt structures that they have. That's a yeah, very good point. Very good points. Yeah. Um, well, gentlemen, it's been an incredible conversation. Loved it. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. Before I do let you go, Gary, tell us about the gold forecast and the work you do at Kitco. Uh, yes, uh, for Kitco, I I do write a daily article for them after hours. It's been labeled, and that's always published by uh, six p.m. Eastern time, I've been doing that for about 12 years. 
We've now started a bi-monthly, or it'll either be every other week or every week chart this, in which we look at the technical indicators for gold and silver. And then I have a premium subscriber-based services that I offer at the Gold Forecast, and that's been around since 2009, thegoldforecast.com. Great. I'll put links to all of that in the description below. Tavi, tell us about Crestcat Capital and anywhere else you'd like to direct people online who want to hear more from you. Well, we run three funds, a global macro loan short and a commodities fund, basically a precious metals focus, but there's really all sorts of metals in that fund uh, in which we have been working with Quentin Haney as our, our partner to really help us um, sort of work towards an activist approach towards that portion of the industry. Um if you want to find more things about Crescat, you can find Crescat.net. We write a lot of research letters, very in-depth ones, uh, very long ones too. Uh, so if you're bored, you can go there and 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 read. <laughs> so and uh, there's also my Twitter at Tavi Costa if you're interested in more kind of freshly uh, takes on the markets. Great. Well, I'll put links to that in the description below as well, gentlemen. Thank you once again for coming on the show. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.